I like to think of our role with our data as a little more active. I want us in the driver's seat. And that's why I like talking about consent, because consent is the choice that you make to impact your privacy. Hi everyone, it's us again, Joy and Salimi, on yet another exciting episode of New Forum. And we are powered by Newcoin Foundation and focus on fostering the expansion of decentralized social applications, also known as Social 3.0, by forming an ecosystem and a community of visionaries, creators, and investors to spark conversations on the topics of crypto, the metaverse, NFTs, and everything Web3. And on this episode of New Farm, we're super honored to introduce Evan McMillan to our New Farm community. Evan is the co-founder and CEO of Disco XYZ, and we're super excited to talk with Evan today about the importance of keys when protecting your data and assets on the metaverse and how Disco is offering a safe space for users to enjoy nuanced Web3 reputation associated to public identifiers across chains and Web2 while maintaining privacy and user user autonomy. Hey, Evan, we're super fired up to start this conversation with you. GM, new fam, thank you so much for having me today. Really excited to be here. Awesome. So how did it all start for you? I mean, this Web3 journey, I bet you were in Web2 once upon a time. So how did this transition happen for you and what you what got you so excited about founding Disco? And if you could share a bit more about your vision of the metaverse. Absolutely. So I have um, I'm sure like many of you, many of your listeners been excited about playing with, building with, exploring what we can do with technology since I was very young. Um, so when I was in school as a kid, that was around the Napster era. So I learned about file sharing and the freedom and restrictions around data and intellectual property, um, just as the first iteration of the publicly accessible internet um, came to fruition. And so uh, when I was an undergrad, I was really excited about free and open source software, about Creative Commons licenses, about the intellectual property-based debate pertaining to data freedom and accessibility. Uh, and it was around that time that I had the absolute best computer science professor of all time, a woman named Elizabeth Stark at Yale, um, who is now an incredible leader and CEO in the Bitcoin community, but at the time was our um, wonderful teacher. And so she introduced us to um, the world of technology-based entrepreneurship. It was along this journey that, um, that I encountered the Bitcoin paper and learned about censorship-resistant networks. Um, and, uh, and so it was that set of experiences that opened my imagination to what could be possible if human beings beings might be able to carry around or own and control their data in the context of interacting with the world around them, as opposed to having that data owned and controlled by other parties and managing the experience on their behalf. So um, when it came to uh, when it came to my own experience of building, I had a lot of different roles in both you know, Web 2 and uh, Web 3 teams, um, some focused on hardware, some focused on enterprise software. Uh, and throughout that whole journey, very rarely in the design process did my teams prioritize what was best for the user, what would be optimally joyful and friction removing for the user, as opposed to advocating on behalf of some other set of interests or enterprise interests. Um, and so earlier this year, I took a step back from my work and decided that I wanted to build something for everyone. Uh, I had you know, done work with incredible teams and seen what was possible when we make data portable and private, independently owned you know, by ourselves. Um, but I wasn't in a position to explore what that meant, bringing something for everyone, uh, when I was so focused on enterprise alone. So um, earlier in the year, I joined together with, um, with some friends, former colleagues, uh, since have been joined by a number of new friends and teammates uh, on the Disco ship, where we are building your identity for the metaverse. And at Disco, we believe that the definition of the metaverse is your ability to show up in any digital or physical environment and receive a personalized experience as a result of the parts of yourself that you choose to share. Wow, I, I'm quite excited about Disco and I want to dive a bit deeper on this topic right now. So it sounds super exciting and inviting, um, you know, the word Disco itself. And could you maybe explain what is the user journey with Disco and how do you envision for us as um, everyday people to use the metaverse in the future? That is a beautiful stack of questions. So to start off very 
you know, basically, I guess at disco, we believe that you like a disco ball are the shining center of the party. You should be able to reflect your data and your identity to the world. You should not feel like a function of someone else's party. You are enough as a whole human being when you show up uh, to the spaces where you participate and the communities where you belong. And so we think that you should be in charge of the data that describes you, not some random dude who made an app that you use sometimes. That's pretty weird. Um, and so our imagination has taken us to a world where we can walk into events and receive benefits based on behaviors we've been doing at home. We can show up with proof that we're part of a community and enjoy experiences online, on chain, and in person. Um, so as we build toward a user journey that meets users where they are in their own personal journey, not assuming, you know, step one of what journey we would like people to take, um, that means that we need to work with the tools that people have today and the understanding that they have today about what's possible in the metaverse and in Web3. That's why to begin, Disco is serving users of the Ethereum community. So folks who already have uh, private keys in their hands with Ethereum compatible wallets, such as MetaMask. And once we help those users become the transport layer for their own data from one app to another, then we will roll in other base chains to make those interoperable, such as Solana, Bitcoin, other EVM compatible chains and others. If you could tell me a little bit more about like this idea of like maintaining privacy and user autonomy, like how would you explain this in the Web3 sense? That's a great question. Well, and I, I think we talk a lot about privacy, mm -hmm. which is kind of like a an end state. Privacy is the status of whether your information is disclosed to others or not, the extent to which it might be disclosed. I like to think of our role with our data as a little more active. I want us in the driver's seat. And that's why I like talking about consent, because consent is the choice that you make to impact your privacy when uh, you are in a position to be in control of how that privacy is um, is. You know, increased or decreased. Uh, in instances when we don't have the opportunity to provide informed consent, when other people are making choices about how our data is shared, that means that our privacy may change, but our consent may not be involved. And that's a disconnect that I think it's really important for us to um, explore in Web3 with the gift of private keys that allow us to publish data publicly, you know, on chain to everyone on earth and in space with an internet connection till the end of the galaxy. And also to have data that is private only to our keys, known only to us, like a secret that, that is, you know, kept unto ourselves. And there's a broad range of, uh, of privacy of diminished privacy, of publicity between those two extremes that we fail to explore when we default to data that is public and on-chain. So I'm really excited about how we can use the superpowers of our private keys to claim a greater level of control over our data and share it with our informed consent, as opposed to having other parties decide how much privacy we can enjoy um, which is the status that we have in Web2 today. A lot of women have complained, you know, experiencing like, you know, sexual assaults and stuff like that while experiencing the metaverse or some form of metaverse. And so us talking about this consent, this ownership, this data and all of that, like, is that some sort of a solution for experiences like that, that, you know, people might face to kind of prevent it? Could that be? That is a great question. So I think if we step back and we revisit, revisit the idea, what does consent mean? Consent is in, you know, in the spaces where I think about it is an affirmative, uh, affirmative invitation, a welcoming of interaction. If I consent to a hug, that means I'm going to welcome your embrace. If I don't consent to a hug, that means I'm going to get the ick if you touch me and I'm going to feel violated. I'm going to feel uncomfortable. And we, as human beings with physical bodies, can grasp the idea of consent pretty well. Either I agree to this physical interaction or I don't. Um, and in digital space, I think Web2 has taught the app builders that, that apps can have 24-7 access to your data. That's the way that the surveillance capitalism economy is built. But if our data represents an extension of us, it describes our bodies, it was made by our bodies, it is owned by our bodies, then does it, does it deserve a level of consent and consideration that we extend also to our bodies? The state of the algorithms on Web2 platforms right ah. now are very static and it's, uh, you know, very 
uh, market driven that you get fed something that you might want to see might not want to see but you don't really have a choice as a you know participant of of the web 2 platforms and i'm wondering how can we maybe as as participants use our data and shape these algorithms better or more efficiently or in a way that i can connect to my community better um, um just from a personal perspective i'm wondering what's your thought on that that is an outstanding point Right. So, you know, today Instagram messes with how close you think you are to your friends to encourage you to buy more stuff. And we have very little visibility into the algorithm that makes these recommendations to us. On Twitter, we can make very limited choices, such as viewing posts in a you know, temporal manner or in the curated Twitter algorithm of preference. So I'm really excited about teams like Lens Protocol that will allow you to choose your own prioritization algorithm to view and consent to the um, ordering of content being surfaced to you and the curation of that content. Um, I think the ability to explore other views of how content is curated will be really exciting and eye-opening. Um, and I think surfacing that algorithm um, as one that is evolving, changeable, um, and is very visible, I think is is, is going to be extraordinarily valuable um, to help surface more relevant and more diverse information to users. But I also think that there is an interesting trade back that we approach. Cheap dopamine is a hell of a drug, and that's what today's algorithms optimize for. Obviously, human interaction is incentives all the way down, and it always has been. And so in Web3, we have an opportunity to chase the designs that invoke human motivation and intent in a natural way. But we also want to do so consciously. So we're prioritizing what's best for those users. Yeah, I think this is these are great points. And I, I also wanted to circle back to when I asked this question about consent and assault and you know bad experiences in, in the in the metaverse. And I didn't get the chance to say thank you for that answer. And I think that it's important that you made some really great points because in the physical, you know, we kind of have this control of our bodies, of our space, or we own things. We can easily say, well, I own this phone or I own this lip balm or whatever, but then how does that work in the digital space? And I feel like more and more, there's so much value in the digital space. We're living there. That's our, kind of like become our norm. It's a norm right now. So I think you, I just wanted to, to, to let you know that I, I really appreciated your, your take on that. Um, I, I super appreciate that you guys are engaging on this topic. I think to dig into it a little bit further, the persistent digital environments, the, you know, the uh, so-called met proprietary metaverses, websites that you hang out inside of with an iPad strapped to your face, basically. <laughs> um, so these persistent digital environments are, you know, populated by avatars, by digital representations of assets, and the capabilities of those avatars are determined by the owners of the space. And so the set of interactions that you can have are made possible or provided by, opened up by the curators of that environment. Any instance where you decrease the cost of creation, you increase the need for curation. So user-generated content flows in, user-generated interactions flow in by the gajillion and suddenly a community moderation challenge. Um, and so in th this really gets into the interplay of freedom of interaction, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, and how that is extended into digital space, enabled at an enterprise or code level, um, but also moderated in that same way, um, and in some inst instances, in a dangerous and centralized way. Could you explain to our community what a DID is? Absolutely. So um, a DID in my book, um, capital D, lowercase i, capital D, is a technical specification written by the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C. I like to think of them as the high wizards of the internet. Um, so this specification basically is a way to create an alias for one of your existing addresses, your email address, your Solana address, your Ethereum address. And when you create that alias, you add a little bit of code to the front of, of your existing address and you're able to derive a new set of signing keys. So what this means is you can take some keys you already have, you add an addition onto them, kind of like putting a backpack onto it, um, 
And, uh, and this new capability, this new set of signing keys allows you to sign private off-chain messages that can be read by many other different kinds of identifiers, different kinds of keys. So DIDs enable uh, us to put a Bitcoin address, an email address, an Ethereum address, and a PGP key into a group chat. And everyone's going to be on the same page right away. So it's kind of like a um, more tangible, visible, shareable um, representation of like your address, of your wallet address? I would think of it in the same way that your wallet address allows you to own and control financial assets because it's a wallet. Your backpack contains a whole lot of data that's more, that's outside of the context of your wallet in our physical space. If we imagine like our actual backpacks in the real world, we carry around more things with us. We carry around our jackets. We carry around our ID cards. We carry around our gym memberships, maybe a water bottle. So for all of the stuff that doesn't fit inside your wallet, all the things that aren't financial assets that are going to wallet, you need somewhere else to carry them around. And in web three, if we want to be owners and custodians of our data, not only do we need to be able to take custody of that data, it needs to be written about us and owned by us. We also need to be able to make statements about other people. We need to be able to sign attestations about others, which means we need some signing keys. And we also need the ability to validate statements that we learn from others, which means we need to be able to resolve signatures from other people's keys. So some benefits of DIDs that make them different than PGP keys that were really popular back in the day is that you can rotate the keys behind your public identifier. So you can maintain a persistent identifier while rotating the keys that sit behind it. Uh, and that's really awesome in terms of being able to preserve your security, to um, have sort of a, a recourse in the event that your keys are compromised. So all of this activity is happening off the blockchain. But the name that you're using, the identifier that you're using can come from the keys that you use in your public ledger from your wallet. So speaking about like, you know, data and, and all of that, I came across a quote of uh, a tweet of yours. I think you posted this on February 20th and it says, um, okay, I just skip the beginning, but it says the future of identity is not NFTs. And then you said, Disco enables the self-sovereign metaverse with informed consent and privacy, like a personal data backpack that travels with you across Web 2 and Web 3. And it's interesting that you said that the future of identity is not NFTs. Can you explain that? Because I think at the moment, people are thinking that it is the NFTs, you know, when you think of PFPs and, and, and stuff like that. So if you could get into it a bit. In... The inimitable words of the character Tyler Durden in the movie Fight Club, you are more than the contents of your wallet. So if we went to a party right now and people could only introduce themselves by saying what was in their bank account, that would be a pretty lame party. It would be hard to find common ground with other people if the only shared interest that you could have was your bank account and your socioeconomic status. So if we want to have more fun together in the metaverse, we need more data than NFTs can provide us at present. NFTs are public tradable assets that you can curate, purchase, obtain, be gifted, steal, get from an airdrop, earn. Um, but you can obtain these assets and you can map them to your wallet address. So you can put them, quote unquote, in your wallet, you could say, um, so that others might see there's an association between these assets and your public address in the same way that I can wear a hat to signal that I'm part of the boys club community. I can wear, um, I can wear this shirt to curate my style and fashion choices. I can buy handbags and um, disco balls and feathers and all kinds of physical accessories to curate around myself to present who I am to the world. Um, but this disco ball, is not me, the person, Evan. This hat is not me, the person, Evan. I am more than the contents of uh, you know, what I can buy with my wallet, these objects and these assets that are tradable and not tied to who I am as a being. Um, what you own is what, not what you know. What you own is not what you can prove. Um, and so I think of your identity as uh, your expression in the world, a list of all the things you've been up to, attached to your name and your ability to control all that information, to make attestations uh, on behalf of all that information you have about yourself. So this metaverse 
that you envision, this identity that is solely designed based off of our data, how can you like help us visualize it? Like how would that, how could that look like? If we imagine how our lives might be different in the future with the ability to show up uh, with our data in various environments and receive a personalized experience. The short version of that is disco will make it so that you never have to fill out a form again. We, as kids, maybe watch the Jetsons on TV and we never see them filling out forms and we certainly don't see them waiting in really long lines. <laughs> so the convenience of being able to show up in one space and have an environment react to you will help us save time and frustration, help us save um, you know, the effort of having to repeat ourselves multiple times to fill out the same form every time we go to the doctor's office if, not, if no information has changed. Um, so if you all imagine yourselves a few years from now, you're at home, you've just received an invitation to the disco disco at the Louvre in Paris. And the only thing that you're going to bring with you when you get off your couch at home is your disco profile. So that means you're going to seamlessly walk through the doors of your building, get into your ride share, blast through airport security, um, all the way to the border screenings, maybe health screenings, the front door of the event and the door of the VIP room where you're already being served free drinks. Um, and so in this metaverse where you can seamlessly move from one environment to another based on the permissions and capabilities that you have, we see a lot more fun and a lot less waiting around. Thank you so much, um, Evan. I think that um, you've said a lot of brilliant, insightful, very informative. We've had a very informative conversation with you and you're you're just like you're so vibrant and so energetic and it's really nice like listening to you and hearing you and I think you're so inspiring and I really thank you for your time and I'm wondering if you have any uh, before you share your social where we can find you because I bet like our people want to like follow you and check out what Disco is up to and all the other projects you're working on could you like maybe leave a few words that like key takeaways to our listeners or community? I think that'd be great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me today. It's been an absolute blast to explore more of our ideas about the future together. Um, for your listeners, I would remind everyone that you are more than the contents of your wallet. And so we are excited to build an ecosystem that celebrates, recognizes, and expresses and rewards all that you bring to the table, all that you are as whole people. Um, if you want to follow our journey and join us on the Disco Ship, you can always visit us at disco.xyz, where I look forward to reading your dreams for the metaverse. On Twitter, you can find me at Proven Authority. You can also follow us on Twitter at Disco XYZ. Thank you so much, Evan. I think it's such a pleasure to have people like you in the space who, you know, make this space even more bright and more accessible and yeah, just more authentic. And so people can really use this technology and really feel safe also in Web3. And I thank everyone for tuning in today. And if you guys want to get more involved within our community, make also sure to follow us on IG and Twitter. We are newform underscore NCO and newcoin. And we also have a private Telegram group and a Discord. And we're going to leave all the links also and Evan's links down in the bio. And yeah, thank you so much for tuning in today. Make sure to like, subscribe and stay tuned to the next episode of New Forum. And thank you, Salimi and Evan. It was a pleasure. Thank you.